Welcome to the Voice of Russia's Daily Discussion. I'm Vivian Nunes. Today we're talking about the House of Lords, the upper house of parliament that's been part of Britain's Westminster system for centuries. In fact, as early as the 1300s, two houses of parliament had emerged in Britain, with bishops and noblemen filling the upper house. Some would say not an awful lot has changed since then. There's still bishops as well as hereditary peers who were born into today's House of Lords. Of course, most of the 800 lords are now appointed as a peer for life because of their professional achievements. Some are independent, most are politically aligned. But after centuries of tradition, the House of Lords could be set for a major shake-up. The coalition government has published a draft bill recommending drastic reforms and in the Queen's speech last week, the government committed itself to action, pledging to make changes so most members of the upper house are elected. All three major parties support Lord's reform, but that's no guarantee it's going to go ahead. In fact, discussion about reform has been going on for well over a century. Today I'll be discussing whether the House of Lords should be reformed, what's wrong with it, why change it, and if anything, what should replace it. Joining me here in the studio, we have Tim Black, a senior writer from the libertarian Spiked magazine, and Darren Hughes from the Electoral Reform Society. Joining us on the phone is Lord Andrew Phillips of Sudbury, a life peer since 1998. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. To begin this discussion, I'd like to ask each of you, first of all, does the House of Lords need to change? Tim Black from Spiked magazine, you've described the House of Lords as an antediluvian check on people power. Why do you think reform is necessary? It's not that I think that a reform is necessary. I'd probably go further than that. I would suggest that we need to uh, abolish the House of Lords full stop. It is a check, if you like, on the democratic will of the people. Uh, it's, uh, it is a check on the will of those that we actually elect to represent us. It is undemocratic and it is unaccountable. Uh, Thomas Paine, of course, once famously described the House of Lords as the uh, remains of aristocratical uh, tyranny. Uh, it's far less aristocratic now than it once was, but it's no less tyrannical. Uh, so I say abolish it. I'll go then to Lord Phillips. As a member of the House of Lords, Lord Phillips, are you unnecessary? Well, there is an argument for saying that. I, I don't think it is. Um, principally, and incidentally, I don't pretend for a minute we're democratic. And I also would want to see some very major reforms. I, I would not, however, advise that it be elected, which, which may sound bizarre in the 21st century, but actually sometimes I think one has to look at things as they are and to be realistic or pragmatic uh, often saves one from doing something that looks good, sounds good in theory, but when you get down to it, actually makes things <clears throat> worse than they are. Now, just to take up the point made, you know, we're sort of tyrannical, and interfere with the will of the people as expressed through the ballot box in electing MPs. Firstly, as he knows, and it's critical to everything I say, the House of Lords can always have its way under our system because of the Parliament Act of 1911, and does. But just to give one reason, main reason, why I think uh, Kim is out of touch on this, uh, the House of Commons itself is now deeply partisan, deeply partisan. To say that we're uh, uh, tyrannical and that, that we should let the Commons have its head without any, any con control by anybody else seems to me to be bonkers. I actually don't have a problem with the House of Commons being partisan. You know, I think one of the main problems with sort of contemporary sort of mainstream uh, parliamentary politics is that many people feel there isn't much difference between uh, the parties. Um, I think Lord Phillips means that by, by partisan, I think Lord Phillips means that uh, there's a kind of uh, petty just voting in line with what, uh, 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 with what the party wants you to, uh, to vote for. Um, I think that what we need is a proper sort of, a, a proper debate, proper sort of um, conflicts over principles and ideas within the, within the House of Commons. But we don't have it. We don't have it, but you know th clearly that is a uh, th that's a deep-seated sort of profound political problem. It's probably the defining Correct. defining sort of political problem of our, of our era. Uh, I do not think that the House of Lords is the answer to that, though. But you don't, if I may say so, go abolishing the House of Lords at a time when the Commons is, uh, I repeat, completely under the control of the party whips. And I agree with you. you pa I'm not not against party politics. Good good grief! I've been in it for 40 years. Got to have it. But we have a more docile, servile House of Commons when it comes to the crucial act of voting than any democracy I'm aware of. And at this point in time, 
when nothing has been done to grapple with that uh, extraordinary fact, once in 513 votes do they vote against the executive, to go ahead now and simply abolish the only constraint that exists on the House of Commons seems to me not to be sensible. Darren Hughes, I'll go to you now. You're a New Zealander originally. In New Zealand, there is only one chamber of parliament. It's the unicameral system. Is that the right way to go? Is there any point at all in having a, a, an upper house of parliament? Well, I think the question is uh, what, uh, what mechanisms exist to hold the executive to account, as, as Lord Phillips has been uh, mentioning. In, in New Zealand, while there is only one chamber, it's elected by proportional representation. So unless you get over 50% of the vote, you don't get over 50% of the seats. So you don't have uh, disproportionate results, uh, as we tend to see under first past the post. So there's a, there's a natural check on the executive because the uh, main party will very rarely get over half the vote. I think here, with such an entrenched first-past-the-post system for the Commons, uh, having a second chamber is a a necessary restraint on on power, a check and balance that's important in the system. And so therefore, how it's constituted is quite important. Uh, The Electoral Reform Society takes the position that uh, if you hold the power to help decide how Britain is run, you ought to be chosen by the British public. And that's a fairly uh, basic uh, tenet of democracy. So unless there was reform to the the Commons uh, to make it more, uh, better reflect uh, the will of the public at general elections, then there really is a need for a a, a body to act as a constraint. Uh, And I guess what I'd say is that right at the minute, what's in front of us is not uh, a proposal to abolish the Lords, but to reform it. Uh, And although many people talk in favour of reform, uh, whenever there's a proposal, people find lots of reasons to hide uh, and and to say why now is not the right time. Uh, But but we, we, we return to that central belief that if you help to run this country, you ought to be chosen by the people who live in this country. If, though, the upper house is elected, and we're talking about partisan politics here, isn't there a risk that you will have the same party in power in the upper house as you do in the House of Commons? Therefore, it it, it loses its role as a check and balance, it becomes a rubber stamp, and all legislation is passed without any sort of debate. On the other hand, the option is if you have one party in government in the House of Commons and an opposition party forms a majority in the upper house, you can have a political deadlock because they simply indiscriminately block every piece of legislation that comes through. Lord Phillips, is that a risk? Yes, I think you're, you're right in expressing both risks. Let me um, say at once that um, I'm out of step with, with my party on, on these issues. The, the Liberal Democrat Party uh, has for a long time been in favour of an elected House of Lords. But uh, uh, I think, you know, ultimately I can't get over the, the, the realities that we face. And both the points you've just made uh, seem to me to be correct and we haven't begun to work out in terms of an elected house of lords arrangements that are practical for example the government's draft bill for reform which the richard committee reported on simply states in clause two that the house of commons will after the house of lords has been elected 100 percent elected continue to be the dominant overriding legislative chamber Um, Now, that is simply unrealistic. If the House of Lords is elected, and indeed it will be elected on a form of proportional representation, some would say that would give it greater legitimacy than the Commons. But the the government, and and, and indeed my party too, says, oh no, no, the House of Commons must continue to have the last word on legislation. And all of that seems to me to be simply unrealistic. The great British public and I am an absolute admirer, I may say, of the great British public, they will not, I believe, if we come to elections, put up with that unreal disposition of powers between the two houses. Darren Hughes from the Electoral Reform Society, you wanted to jump in? Can I just pick up on this point of of the uh, risks that you mentioned? Because I think while uh, there is um, some logic behind them existing as risks, they are by no means certainties. Uh, It is not certain uh, that uh, such uh, rampant uh, partisanship uh, would take place any any more than the risk exists right now when a a Prime Minister from a particular political party that happens to be in office on on well well less than 50% 
support uh, of this country, gets to appoint people to uh, one of the two houses of parliament. Since the election just two years ago, nearly 120 people have been handpicked uh, by the political parties to sit uh, in the upper house. Now, now that, that is a recipe for near certain partisanship, uh, as opposed to an election for the House of Lords staged over the course of a number of years, uh, elected one third at a time. So it would, it would take into account the various political cycles and fortunes that beset all parties over that period of time. And of course, the proposal uh, in front of us at the present time uh, would be for non-renewable terms. So uh, members of the upper house wouldn't have one eye on re-election. And, and the sort of thing Lord Phillips was uh, arguing for before, a, a greater uh, rebelling against the party line, the ability to defeat uh, the government on proposals, I think would be far more likely with politicians uh, who had been uh, elected to serve, so they had legitimacy, uh, but weren't uh, keeping their eye on, on the re-election cycle uh, as members of the Commons uh, have to do. So, so although, the, although the two examples you mentioned are risks, uh, they are near certainties at the moment, and uh, with, with respect to the current operation and constitution of the uh, House of Lords, and, and, and I don't think that it's a guarantee that under an elected system that would be any worse. I, I think it would be better. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, where we're discussing reforming the House of Lords. Joining me is Tim Black from Spiked Magazine, Darren Hughes from the Electoral Reform Society, and Lord Phillips of Sudbury. I might just go to a, a clip now. This is taken from the House of Lords debate a few days ago. The first voice we'll hear is that of Lord Ashdown, the former Liberal Democrat leader. The other is Lord Phillips, who we have joining us on the phone. 60% of this place is already appointed here as members of parliament from the other end by their party leaders. Now that is pure patronage, not patronage in any way diluted by democracy. And even though he points out flaws in the democratic system, some of which I agree with, surely a system where some, which has some contact with democracy is better than a system which has none, but is a system of pure patronage. Well, <clears throat> as I said to my noble friend before, and I, I do genuinely admire his courage and principle uh, in putting forward the point he does with such strength. But if I could remind him, it was he who put me here. No, hang on, hang on, hang on. I haven't finished my point. And he got, and he got, he got absolutely no, no encouragement from me at all to think that I was going to be a good little boy and follow my party whip ah. night in, night out, and I bloody well don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman, the, honor, the noble lord, for giving way. The fact that I put him here does not make it any better, it makes it worse. It was that I had to put him here to fulfil our, our functions here. And although, of course, he did not give me any undertakings, I would remind him that he came here to represent a party who has had it in their manifesto for a hundred years. He must have known what was expected of him. Well, Headmaster, um, <coughs> I, to, be honest, to be honest, I didn't. And uh, if he'd tapped me on that point, he would have... Um, realised that I was then not certain as to what my views were about election and having been here, I'm afraid my views now are certain. I want heavy reform of this place but not direct election. So Lord Phillips, if not by direct election, how should members of the House of Lords be chosen? You say about Lord Ashdown's point, and he's you know, a very highly distinguished uh, politician and uh, a passionate uh, supporter of elections and I and I absolutely understand where he's coming from. It's just that, I suppose, being an old lawyer, there's nothing like lawyers for being pragmatic. And uh, I'm afraid to say that I think uh, the, the patronage that he goes on about overlooks the fact that we don't sign on the dotted line when we get in. We haven't made commitments to a constituency party in order to get the candidacy, let alone to a regional party where I fear they will naturally select the sort of party faithful. But uh, come back to it. Uh, at the moment in the Lords, the Prime Minister does not appoint all partisans. A quarter of the Lords are crossbenchers. And they are crucial to the functioning of the House of Lords because they very often, they split all ways, but sometimes they're fairly united in being for or against a particular amendment to a particular bill. And they, of themselves, enable us to be much more independent. I don't see how a crossbench element can survive in an elected House of Lords. It is one proposal. 
to have 20% of the, um, the members of the House of Lords um, nominated and not elected. But they're going to be inferior animals in an inferior house. Uh, and indeed, I think they're going to be paid less than the elected members. Uh, and um, so I just feel that we cannot go forward with elections. I, I merely know that if we go ahead on the present basis, and we haven't even sorted out powers and functions as between the two houses, and the government bill doesn't even have a referendum to enable the people of this country to express their view, we are, I would put it a bit rudely, I believe that the proposals for reform are half-baked, and if we go ahead with them, we could end up, and I believe it would end up, with a significantly reduced a parliament as a whole. Lord Phillips, are you saying then, just briefly, that you want a 100% appointed House of Lords? Well, there are all sorts of other reforms I want, including, incidentally, a statutory appointments commission with statutory criteria that achieves balance, age, sex, region, occupation, that sort of thing. But uh, I do for the moment, until we've worked through um, a, a great many crucial issues, it is just not a ripe time to contemplate elections. Tim Black from Spiked magazine, you would prefer if there wasn't a House of Lords, but if there is going to be one, how do you think members should be put into that role? I, I don't think there's much uh, fudging with my position. I, I would uh, continue to insist that we do need to uh, abolish the House of Lords on, on the very democratic grounds. Listening to uh, Lord Phillips uh, during that clip, his main defence of the House of Lords is that um, it will offer a kind of independent... Uh, space or an independent check, if you like, on uh, the House of Commons. Uh, the House of Commons is too partisan, it's too dominated by uh, party politics. What you need are these free, independent, wise uh, men and, and women sat in the upper chamber or effectively knowing best, effectively saying when the people's uh, elected representatives have gone too far or have made a slightly uh, foolish uh, decision. Um, and as, as far as I'm concerned, that is, is simply a, that events is an absolute distrust of the people. It, develop, it, it events is an absolute distrust of, of the people's uh, elected representatives. Throughout this discussion, I've heard Darren as well talk about how we need a, a restraint on, uh, on power, how we need, uh, and Lord Phillips said, a constraint on, on power. I don't see what is so wrong with simply having uh, a fully-fledged, mature democracy, one that does not have to be sort of kept in, in check by uh, our supposed betters uh, sat in the House of Lords. But, but the, the problem with the House of Commons elected under first past the post is that it does give, in, in nearly every election other than the most recent one, it gives disproportionate power to, to parties who don't have over half the support of the country, so par right. parties can win thumping majorities and run the country on on as on as little as a third support uh, of the country. So, so the the, the problem, unless we get reform to the House of Commons and make it better look like uh, that this country, then then that would be giving an enormous amount of power to a very small <coughs> number of, of people. So, uh, th th that that was the point I was making about if you if you if we have, if we have to maintain that system, uh, then the, an upper house properly elected uh, can can act as a restraint on um, rampant executive power. Can oh. I just chip in? The, the number of people turning out to exercise their precious votes is on a downhill decline and has been since the early 50s when nearly 90% of the population voted. And they were, don't forget, a lot less educated, in inverted commas, than they now are. Today it's hovering around 60%, and the local elections last week, what was it, 30% something? And... What I say to you is that uh, you've got to have regard to the practicalities. The House of Commons now, because it only votes once every two years in hundreds and hundreds of divisions against the lords and masters of the government, is a useless check on the tsunami of legislation that pours out of the British Parliament. We legislate more than any free democracy in the Western world by miles. 100%, 200%, in some cases, 300% more law. 12 to 15,000 pages of new statute law a year. How is that enabled? Because of our 
ruthless whipping and patronage system. I, I, I agree with some of those points, uh, Lord Phillips, but, but and, and particularly if you raise international examples, one of the things that in this debate cannot be run away from is that uh, Great Britain is seen as being the mother of democracy, and yet one of its two houses of parliament is entirely appointed by politicians appointing other politicians. And for all the arguments that need to be resolved properly around primacy and, and the amount people are paid and all, all those proper things, they're, they're all um, smoke screens that get us away from the main point, which is that at the moment the people who help to run Great Britain are not elected by the British public. And that's not democracy, and that's why we definitely need uh, democracy and reform of the House of Lords. Well, that, that's, uh, you, <laughs> if you want me to come back on that, we go over the whole argument. Again, I emphasize I am not against election, but I am against election now on the basis contemplated now because I am convinced it will work to the real disadvantage of this wonderful country of ours uh, in two particular respects. A, the loss of independence, which is vital in one of our two chambers and preferably both. And secondly, uh, the experience of the people in the Lords. And we, we, we don't have any fancy notions about ourselves. We are absolutely ready to accept that the Commons has the last word willy-nilly, and it does. But the quality of legislation, if the House of Lords was replaced by uh, elected men and women, excellent men and women, but men and women then under the party whip, and on the whole, in modern politics, the people who get elected are young and have done little but politics. I do have to say that I think we cannot go ahead on that basis now. Well, it's, it's nearly 80% male, the House of Lords, at the moment, when there's the... In, when there's and that the should be changed. That's part of the statutory criteria that most of us want to see brought in. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. Tim Black from Spike magazine, will we lose that role of people in the community who are experienced, they've excelled in their fields, they've got a lot of life experience, if you replace that either with no House of Lords or with just a House of Lords that is elected basically of politicians? As I say, I, I don't doubt uh, that people uh, like Lord Phillips have uh, expertise or have experience that is certainly distinct from those largely sort of career politicians in, in the House of Commons. But I'm just arguing from a point of principle uh, that just because someone has a certain expertise or a certain set of experiences, why should that be allowed to trump the will of the Commons, the will of the people? I don't doubt. But it doesn't. They trump us, and that's vital. But you do have power. You do have powers to block certain pieces of legislation. Only to temporarily. If they stick at it, they override anything we but put up to them. So the Commons has primacy now, and it would do under totally. a reformed House it, of Lords. It does, but, but the House of Lords is still sort of an institutional expression of uh, a, a distrust of democracy. I don't. I don't see how you can sort of get around that problem. That there are serious problems with uh, party politics as as it's currently constituted. Yes, of course. You know, the majority of people do not vote for either party. Forty percent of right. people do not vote for either party. That's right. But that is a problem with party politics right now. Uh, and. But Just because there is a problem with party politics, I do not think you should therefore defend an undemocratic institution and an undemocratic principle. Uh, and just to go back to Down, because Down, of course, said that uh, uh, currently uh, the the, uh, the current first past the post electoral system is is deeply flawed. Now, I'm I have no doubt that Down would uh, prefer a more proportional electoral system, but he seems to have sort of because the, that fight for the time being seems to have been lost. He himself is therefore willing to argue and defend a undemocratic institution, i.e., the House of Lords, whether it is elected oh, or no, not. No. I'm, I'm str strongly arguing for an elected uh, House of Lords, and indeed the Electoral Reform Society would like to see 100% of the uh, upper house elected, but the proposal from the government at the present time is for 80% uh, with the balance uh, be being appointed. The, the, the point I'm making about first past the post is, is for precisely the 40% of people you just mentioned who don't vote for either party. Largely, uh, those people go unrepresented uh, in the parliament, so it's no wonder that uh, voter turnout uh, falls, but of course that, that is a, a separate uh, argument. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at the up, at, at the upper house, and it j just seems to me that uh, if that's going to be one of the two houses that runs the country, uh, then people ought to have a say about who sits there. 
On that matter of giving more power to the people which you raised, Tim Black, if all three parties agree reform is necessary and it's time to act on this, should there be a referendum on this? The Prime Minister David Cameron says a referendum is not necessary, there's already a consensus, but one might argue everyone in Britain should get to have a say on this and they might well not have voted at the last election. Tim Black, what do you think? I'm all for referendums, I'm all, uh, uh, referenda, sorry. and perhaps in this case there should be a referendum, but I think what's, what's marked uh, about the uh, drive for reform of the House of Lords is that it's a rather sort of elite pursuit. It is not a particularly popular issue. There are not people on the streets demanding that the House of Lords be made uh, mainly elected, uh, let alone fully elected. Um, it, it just seems to be a rather sort of technical fix, uh, dreamt up largely uh, uh, among uh, Liberal Democrats, uh, to try to sort of solve or sort of try to meet some sort of larger political problem. Can I just leap in on that? I take your point that it's not a popular issue at the moment, but I do feel very strongly that there should be a referendum on it because it is when you're changing the basis on which one of your two houses of parliament is constituted, that's huge. And uh, it's odd because you were arguing a little while back, I think, that, you know, people like me didn't trust the people enough. Well, I, I have huge trust in the average man and woman of this country, and I do want them to have a say in, in the election. I don't want this decision to be decided by an elite of, of commons and lords, men and women. And what's more, I have to tell you that if you give the good people of England and Wales, Scotland and Ireland, the chance to understand the issues, then they will be interested, and I've done it myself. I've held public meetings on this, and people do come, they want to hear, they, they do develop views. It's their jolly parliament, and we should not be making huge fundamental change to it without ensuring that they are engaged and they do have a chance to say their piece. And um, I hope to goodness that um, whatever transpires out of this, that we will end up with a referendum. Darren Hughes from the Electoral Reform Society, do you also favour a referendum? Well, I, th I think one of the things to acknowledge in, in this debate is that a lot of the people, uh, and by this I don't mean Lord Phillips, but a number of the people who have been out uh, calling for a referendum are doing so quite cynically. It, it's just another distraction, uh, it's another smokescreen. They're hoping to kick this issue into the long grass. And so one way of, of uh, diverting the debate is to try and stop it from being about a democratically elected House to about whether there's a need for a referendum on that. Uh, there's I'm a, sure there's well, I, and I, I was very clear, very clear to uh, make that, make <laughs> that distinction, but but, <laughs> but, 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 but I, I did I did listen with interest to some of the, uh, the peers who were on the uh, joint committee uh, boldly uh, recommending a, a referendum. That very same people who were opposed to last year's referendum, saying it was it was a waste of time. So I think there isn't there is a very political attempt uh, in order to preserve the current uh, system uh, to to kick it into the long grass by, by throwing a, a lot of uh, distractions. The, the three main political parties all campaigned at the last election uh, on the basis that they wanted to see a more democratic, not less democratic, House of Lords. Uh, public opinion and, and all the polling has always shown that that's what people want. I, I agree with Tim that, that it's not the issue that people take up placards about and, and march uh, along the streets, but that, that doesn't mean it's not an important issue that needs to be addressed. So, so I, I, I do question the motives of some of the people uh, who say there should be a referendum because I, I think that it's just a distraction from keeping their word uh, of what was in the manifesto. The substance of this is about getting more democracy uh, into our parliament so that people can have more faith uh, in their elected representatives. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thanks to each of my guests for joining us here at The Voice of Russia in London. We had Tim Black from Spiked Magazine, Darren Hughes from the Electoral Reform Society and Lord Phillips of Sudbury. Thanks to each of you.